Thank you for listening to this weekend's message. For more information about events or details here at New Tribe Church, visit us online at newtribe.church. Be sure to also look for us on Facebook and Instagram at New Tribe Church. Have you guys enjoyed this series, Frequency? I hope you've been challenged by it, encouraged. We're rolling into a, a, a new part today. We've been in this series called Frequency. Do you hear what I hear? And really, it's been a message series about hearing God's voice. And today, our teaching pastor, one of our teaching pastors, Michael Stevens, is going to be bringing the word. You're in for a great treat. Uh, he always brings a great word when he comes. Do you guys help welcome Pastor Michael this morning? We did the thing where we weren't sure if we were going to bro hug or fist bump and you guys, we let you guys in on that moment. Well, good morning, New Tribe. Merry Christmas, y'all. That was Merry Christmas, y'all. Merry All right, there we go. Well, I am, uh, I'm excited to bring the word today. Um, this makes message number four in the series Frequency. Uh, did you guys enjoy the, the message last week, the Ministry of Angels? Wasn't that good? Yeah. Like three of you? Okay. Uh, I make four. No, I, I, love, that, I love that message and... Uh, you know, I hope that you were more than drawn to wonder. I hope that you engaged the Lord in that arena in the last week and asked the Lord for angelic activity in your life. Um, my wife has a very uh, special gift from the Lord in the area of the prophetic. Uh, most people don't know this about her. Um, she sees angels every day. Um, you know, every morning uh, she rolls over and there I am. It's just, it's amazing. Uh, <laughs> I was waiting all week to say that. <laughs> so I had planned to teach on the Magi and the Star of Bethlehem today, and it's something that I, I love. I've, I've been looking into it for years and really uh, put my nose in the books the last month, getting ready for today. And uh, around Thursday last week, uh, I called Jared, and in, in the short of the conversation is I said, I don't think that's the direction we're headed on Sunday. And uh, so we prayed about it, talked about it, and I mean, we're in a series called Frequency, so by all means, let's go where God's leading, and let's hear what God's speaking, right? Um, so today, we're going to look at tuning out the accusations of the enemy by tuning into the testimony of Jesus. Y'all want to do that? All right, let me pray, and then we'll jump in. Lord, we love you, and we thank you for your voice. We thank you that your testimony, your one whisper from your throne sets angels to flight causes demons to tremble, and sets everything in order. And so, Father, I ask you today that you would silence the voice of accusation for everyone in this room, that you would release the testimony of Jesus, that you would open ears, that you would open eyes, Lord, that people would hear you and see you for the first time today, and that you would encounter them. Lord, we, we ask you, Holy Spirit, take whatever you're hearing in the throne room, Take whatever movements are taking place in, in the Father and the Son's heart and declare them to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. So the first place jumping in is to, is to look at, you know, what does is, what is the voice of the Lord sound like? And there's a lot of places throughout the Psalms and the text that talk about what the voice of the Lord sounds like. And uh, two of my favorite are Ezekiel 43.2 and Revelation 1.15. And there's a lot of verses on this that talk about that the voice of the Lord sounds like rushing water. And when I think of rushing water, I think of like Niagara Falls. It's powerful, it's, it, it, it drives energy, it, it creates refreshment for people, it's awesome, it's wonder. But the sound of uh, uh, Niagara Falls is, is, this, is the sound of rushing water. It's actually white noise. And, and the, the other picture, I just like to say this, the other picture I like about Niagara Falls is it's almost like this picture of a constant dialogue from God coming from heaven. And we just have to tap into it. So, you know, we're all familiar with what white noise is. Um, I'm a big white noise fan. I, have a, I sleep with a fan in our room. It's the one area that I am unapologetically selfish in my marriage that I don't care if our room is 30 degrees, I'm sleeping with a fan on. Like my wife can bundle up in seven sleeping bags and 14 blankets and a heated pillow like a cocoon. I'm sleeping with the fan on. That's what's going to happen. Um, and our son has a white noise machine in his room. Our daughters have a white noise machine in their room. And the reason is because it helps us sleep. And the reason it helps us sleep is because it drowns out other noise. And so I Googled white noise just to see what would come up on like the first scientific page. And I love that this came up because it it's literally fits right into the message today. It says the adjective white is used to describe this type of noise because of the way white light works. 
White light is a light that is made up of all the different colors and frequencies of light combined together. In the same way, white noise is a combination of all of the different frequencies of sound. You can think of white noise as 20,000 tones all playing at the same time. So God's not speaking on one frequency, he's speaking on 20,000 frequencies. And it's, it's just incumbent upon us to, to engage the Lord and find out what are the couple frequencies that we hear him on. I'm not gonna get into all of that today, but next time we do a prophetic seminar, please come and I promise you'll be encouraged. So let's keep going. Because white noise contains all frequencies, it is frequently used to mask other sounds. If you are in a hotel and voices from the room next door are leaking into your room, you might turn on a fan to drown out the noises. Amen, somebody. The fan produces good approximation of white noise, or a good amount, and it works because when you turn on a fan to create white noise, you are essentially creating a source of a thousand voices, and the voice next door makes 1,001 voices, and your brain can't pick it out anymore. So we tune in to the voice of the Lord, which is like rushing water. We hear the Lord on 20,000 different frequencies. So when the accusation of the enemy tries to come in, it's one more out of 20,000 and our spirit and our brain can't pick it up anymore. So today we're gonna look at tuning out or drowning out the accusation of the enemy by tuning in to the testimony of Jesus, who is just the voice of the Lord, which sounds like rushing water. So the first place I wanna go to, if you have your Bible, is Revelation 19.10. I encourage you, if you have it in paper, I highly encourage you that you look at it on paper because it helps you see how everything puts together. But in Revelation 19.10, it says, worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And I just wanna touch on this very quickly, but uh, worship, uh, study of the word, the preaching of the word, healing ministry, prophetic ministry, this is just part of what we do here at New Tribe. It's part of our culture. We don't force it, it's just part of our DNA. We love to enter into the presence of God in worship. We love to preach uh, the Bible with fresh revelation and sound doctrine. We love to see sick bodies healed. We like to see uh, pain go away. We like to see people get set free. We like to see addictions broken. We like to see marriages put back together. We like to see people get free. And we like to see people receive prophetic words that makes them realize for the first time that out of seven billion people on the planet, God knows the individual movements of their heart. It's just part of who we are. And we recently even had a, a prophetic seminar back uh, about a month ago that kind of kicked this whole thing off called Frequency. And we had 60 or 70 people show up and it was awesome to see 60 or 70 people who had never given a prophetic word. And for those of you who don't know what that is, I'll explain it in a minute, who had never given a prophetic word and who had never received a prophetic word go throughout the day from about 9 a.m. till 2 p.m. and through teaching and exercises, see them grow in confidence that they were already hearing God and also grow in confidence when they, they, you see that moment where all of a sudden somebody gives them a word and they realize that out of seven billion people on the planet, God knew the movements of their heart that day and God knew what was going on in their life. And then to see them give a word and the light bulb go off that out of seven billion people, the Lord was willing to share with them what's going on in that other person's heart so they could strengthen and encourage them as well. And that's really, that's why it's part of our DNA. I mean, at the end of the day, who doesn't like to be encouraged? Any takers? Uh, Somebody doesn't like to? Yep, all right, so maybe we got some grumpy mumpies in here that need to be elbowed. Just elbow them right there in the rib cage. Careful, they will punch you in the face. No, but it's it's a reason that we we don't do grumpy Christianity here at New Tribe. We don't, it's no fun. I mean, there's nothing worse than a grumpy Christian. It's, It's like a homeless millionaire. We just don't do it here. We have fun, we, that there is joy in the presence of the Lord, there is pleasure in him evermore. And so in 1 Corinthians 14, three, it says, but he who prophesies speaks edification, exhortation, and comfort. And so part of the the DNA of this is that when you give a prophetic word, when you prophesy over somebody, you are edifying them, you're building them up, you're exhorting them, you're confirming what God is currently doing in their life, and you're comforting them. And scripture is very clear that we are to desire spiritual gifts, but that we are also to desire prophecy. In 1 Corinthians 14, 1, it says, pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. And just to point this out, the same guy who wrote this, who wrote the majority of the New Testament, wrote this verse as well, the Apostle Paul, the greatest evangelist of all time, uh, next to Jesus, he wrote this passage. And he was brilliant in the way he put it together because in, in 1 Corinthians 13, the whole chapter preceding this, it's the famous love chapter, right? Love is patient, love is kind. We, we, we've heard this chapter recited at least at a couple of weddings in our time, right? And he proceeds it, and then he starts this next verse with pursue love, earnestly desire spiritual gifts, but especially 
that you may prophesy. And it's, it's interesting to me that the number two gifts in all of the, the spiritual gifts in, in the text um, that cause the most apprehension in people's hearts in the body of Christ are speaking in tongues and prophecy. And as soon as I said speaking in tongues, somebody in here was like, what's gonna happen? It's not gonna get crazy today, I promise. Uh, just come back next week, we'll get to it then. I'm kidding, that's not next week. I don't even know what he's talking about next week. But here's the thing, speaking in tongues, according to 1 Corinthians 12, 1 Corinthians 14, Ephesians 6, and in the end of Jude, it says that speaking in tongues builds us up in our most holy faith. It empowers us to live a righteous lifestyle unto holiness, and it empowers us to stand against the works of the devil. I'll take some of that, right? Anybody else? Prophecy, it's not about strengthening the individual believer like yourself, but it's about hearing from the Lord and strengthening the body of Christ and edifying them and exhorting them and comforting them. So leave it to the enemy to take the number one gift that strengthens the individual believer and the number one gift that strengthens the body of Christ and the number two gifts that Paul commands us to pursue. It's the two that he singles out. He commands us to pursue these and make it those two gifts, the ones that the enemy has gotten us to be so apprehensive about tapping into the heart of God with. But Paul knows that we need a little like cozy into this. So he says, listen, pursue love. Like we can all get on board with that. He commands us pursue love, pursue spiritual gifts. And he commands us to pursue prophecy. Now, he, he sets the context in this that spiritual gifts, particularly prophecy, should always function out of the place of love. Always. Should always be out of the place of love. And that the fruits of the Spirit should validate the gifts of the Spirit, not the other way around. In other words, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and gentleness should accompany and support the prophetic word given. The prophetic word should never encourage the opposite of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So the fruits always validate the gifts, not the other way around. Let me, let me put it this way. I'm with Paul. Paul said, I wish that you all spoke in tongues. I'm going to agree with Paul. I wish that you all spoke in tongues. But I don't care if you speak in tongues, if you're a jerk in English. I just don't. I would rather you encourage people and honor people and strengthen them and build them up. I'll put it this way. I don't, I'll go with Paul. Paul said, I want you all to prophesy. So I'm going to say what Paul said. I want you all to prophesy. But I don't care if you prophesy like Elijah, if you gossip like People Magazine in The View. I don't, I would rather you honor people, build people up, strengthen people, steward your words, honor what you know about somebody and keep their information to yourself and not share it with anyone else. I mean, we all have that friend, right? We have that friend that we love them, right? But there's certain things we don't share with that friend because we don't necessarily trust what they're gonna do with it. So I'm just gonna say this, there's a direct correlation between how we steward what the Lord gives us and how much he's willing to give us, okay? so. The, the key here is that all gifts and ministries of the Holy Spirit, particularly prophecy, should be the overflow of our love for Jesus, manifesting in love for our neighbor in a way that provokes our neighbor to worship and to love Jesus. Let me say that again. It's the first and second commandment. Love the Lord God with all your mind, soul, heart, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. We are to love people out of the overflow of our love for Jesus. We are to love people in a way that provokes them to love Jesus. It's a good word. So what is prophecy? So we, we briefly, just very briefly established that prophecy, it edifies, it exhorts, and it comforts. We, we threw that out there. It edifies, it comforts, and it exhorts. But what is it? And, and we, need to, we need to touch on this just a little bit. Um, that it, in the midst of edification, in the midst of comfort, in the midst of exhortation, in the midst of building up the church, there's this problem where uh, most people in the church are unfamiliar with prophecy because all we've really seen from it is what we see on TV, what we see uh, on, on, on magazines, you know, National Enquirer, movies. And it's usually some guy that's really weird or, or it's a, a doomsday prophet or it's, um, or it's a clairvoyant or a medium or something like that. When the reality is the Bible has so much to say about prophecy that has nothing to do with any of those things and everything to do with tapping into the heart of God and the emotions of God for the individual believer in the church as a whole that strengthens them and empowers them in the Holy Spirit to pursue Pursue the fullness of what God has for them in a spirit-filled, Jesus-filled lifestyle that allows them to reach the full potential that God has designed for them to accomplish in their lifetime. They're two vastly, vastly different things. And so there's a clear picture in the book of Revelation. When you look at Revelation 19.10, 
hold that page, flip over to Revelation 12, 10. And there's this, two, there's this picture of two dialogues taking place in heaven. You have Jesus who is standing at the right hand of the Father. And it says that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And then over here, you have this accuser of the brethren. And it says the accuser of the brethren who accused them before God day and night. And he's over here hurling accusations at the body of Christ. And so you have this picture where Jesus is at the right hand of the father and he's looking at the bride of Christ and we're dressed in white. There's not one blemish. There's not one imperfection. There's not one sin. There's not one area of compromise. There's not one area of weakness. And we have come in to the fullness of the destiny that God has created us to be in. And that's how he sees us now. When he looks at you right now, he sees the end result. And some of you are like, yeah, but I'm over here and I'm struggling with this, 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 and this. And I don't know if Jesus sees me that way. No, 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 no. He sees you this way. He knows you have this going on, but he knows what the end result is going to be, is that you're going to be caught up into the fullness and the glory that he created you to walk in. And that's why God has so much patience with us. He has so much patience with us here. It says he's slow to anger. He's full of compassion. He's steadfast in love and mercy because he can see the process taking place. He's the only one that can see the end picture before it's even remotely completed. Us, on the other hand, we get really frustrated. We're like, God, if you can make them do this and be like this and say that and quit doing that and be this person and act like that and stop doing that. We've got this whole list. And he's like, oh, slow your jets. Like, slow your jets. Like, you're on step nine and they're on like step 0.5. And I know where this thing's going. So be patient with me. Be steadfast in love. Be slow to anger. Be great in mercy like I am. And let me work this thing out with them. I promise I'm going to get them here. And so when, the, when we get a prophetic word from somebody and somebody prophesies over us, the, the, the Lord doesn't, I'll, I'll give you an example. I need to give a real life example of this. So I had a guy walk in um, to a prophetic, a prophetic uh, ministry time and he walks in and this is gonna help you guys see very clearly what a picture of prophecy is. He walks in and I see the, the word greed written right across his forehead. Like in my mind's eye, I saw this big word greed in green right across his forehead. And I could have walked up and said, hey, the Lord says you're really greedy and you need to stop it. Like that's not gonna go over. Well, that guy's not coming back, right? But that would, that would not have been the testimony of Jesus because he may be greedy here, but he's not greedy here. So I, when he came and sat down, I said, I want you to know that the Lord says you're a generous giver. And he goes, I'll take you up on that. And he became, he became one of the most generous, selfless people you'd ever met. Just took one word to break the accusation of the enemy. Because the accusation of the enemy over him is, you're a greedy, you know what, Right? That's what the accusation of the enemy was over him. And so Jesus is at the right hand calling us out of our sin, not calling out our sin, calling us out of our sin into our destiny. But the accuser, he's over here and he's hurling accusations day and night. He's hurling accusations. And you say, well, I don't really feel like I, I hear the accusations of the enemy. No, 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 you do, I promise. Because when Jesus prophesies over you and he releases his testimony over you, he wants you to know that it's the testimony of Jesus. He wants you to know it's coming from him because it's gonna draw you into him. But the enemy knows that if you were to know that he was the one hurling accusations at you and you knew it was coming from him and you knew how wicked and evil and defiled he is, it would actually not, it wouldn't cause you to run to the devil. It would actually cause you to run to the arms of Jesus. So he masks his voice and it sounds like you're thinking, 1 Corinthians 2, 16, but you have the mind of Christ. So when you start, your mind starts having flooding thoughts that do not agree with what Jesus thinks about you, it's not you processing and beating yourself up, it's you tapping in to the accusations of the enemy over your life and coming into agreement with those things. So what the enemy does is he starts getting you to think of the past, stuff you did five years ago, stuff you did two years ago, stuff you did this morning, stuff you did last night, and he starts berating you with all of your shortcomings, all of your failures, and those are the things you begin to dwell on. He begins to, he begins to, to, to bring up everything that you've done wrong, every shortcoming in your life. And, and, but he, he does it in a way that you're standing there and you wake up at 3 a.m. and you start thinking, man, I did this, I did that, I haven't done this, I should be doing this, I'm not doing this, I'm acting this way towards this person, I'm treating my wife this way, my kids this way. And you don't realize that what's happening is you're actually being berated by accusations of the enemy being hurled at you from the accuser. And so there's this picture of in the throne room where you've got John Doe and he's standing here and the, the, the accusation of the enemy is John Doe's lazy. John Doe doesn't take care of his family. John Doe's a terrible father. He doesn't respond to his children. He's aloof. He, he's, he's a bad steward of his finances. He's caught up in pornography. He's caught up in all of these things. And Jesus is over here and he looks at the accuser and he goes, you shut up, John, you're a good father. 
You're a good dad. You're diligent. I know this picture. I know who you're gonna be. You're good with your time. You're good with your money. Your kids are not gonna turn out like your father. They're gonna turn out like my father. It's a completely different picture from the Lord. And the reality is, is the other thing, the enemy wants you to believe that God is somehow mad at you, like this perpetually angry God. When the reality is the testimony of scripture is completely opposite. Did you know that when Paul introduces God the majority of the time, he introduces him as the blessed God, which translates the happy God. That feels weird to say for some people, right? The happy God. But that's what Paul called him. That's the scripture. You serve a glad God. And and just think about this. Even if God was mad at you about your sin, which he's not, because you've been redeemed by Jesus, but even if God was mad at you, let's just say you live 90, 100 years. And and sorry if some of you are encroaching on 90, let's just say 120 for you. So let's just shrink eternity down to 100 billion years. So this is a 100 billion year timeline right here. Your 90 to 120 years is a microscopic dot on this timeline. So even over the next 100 billion years, God gets to fully enjoy you without any weakness and without any compromise in your life. And that's who he's calling you into. But the enemy doesn't want you to see that picture. He wants you to focus on now. He wants you to focus on, say, like anxiety. He wants you to focus on, why do I have anxiety? What triggers it? Where did it come from? How can I get free from it? Why can't I get rid of it? All these things, rather than remember that Jesus has deputized you to be a peacemaker. He wants you to focus on all of your shortcomings and how you've fallen short of the glory of God, rather than remember that you have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus. You have been raised up in resurrection power. You have been sealed with the spirit as a guarantee and empowered to to walk in the image of the one that you were made in, and that is the glory of God. He wants you to forget that Jesus is taking you from strength to strength, from faith to faith, and from glory to glory. So you may be falling short of the full glory, but the scripture says that you're on a glory track that's getting you to where God is designing for you to be. He wants you to remember all of the sin in your life that has kept you from coming to God. There's even people here today that you you haven't made a decision to follow Jesus yet and name him as your Lord and Savior or rededicate your life because your sin is keeping you from coming to God. Your sin may keep you from coming to God, but it will not keep God from coming to you. He will track you down, he will win your heart in love, and he will love you so hard until you just surrender. He's the ultimate stalker. (laughs) And he will get his prey, pun intended. (laughs) Took, Took some of you a second. So the greatest solution to drowning out the voice of the enemy is to tune into the testimony of Jesus. So how do we tune in? Jared's brought this up every week. Here's the dial, you're here, you turn here. I accidentally found this awesome worship station because I accidentally bumped it over from whatever it is, like 92.1 to 92.2. This awesome worship station was literally like one number off. I didn't even know it was there. And so tuning in to something also means that we have to tune out of other things. So just bluntly put, we have to make adjustments to what we watch, what we read, what we look upon, what we listen to. You know, when we listen to music that doesn't glorify God, and I'm not talking about, you know, like, you know, Jason Mraz and I won't give up on you, nothing like that. Like, that's a happy, good, fun song. Like, we like that song, it makes us feel good. I'm talking about stuff that promotes promiscuity and profanity and, 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 and vulgarness and sex lies and all that junk. Like, I don't need to go through the list of, of what constitutes ungodly music, right? Like, I think we can all figure that out. But when we listen to music that doesn't glorify God and, and we read gossip columns and we watch TV and, and shows and, and series that, that are, are completely contrary to the citizens of heaven, that are completely contrary to the things of God and dishonor other people, we will ultimately reap the fruit of those things in our life, right? Now you say, well, I listen to this, I watch that and I look at that, but I don't act like that. Mm, well, the enemy's a little more cunning than that. He's not gonna give you tit for tat on sin. Like you're not gonna go, Like watch something about an affair and then go have an affair the next day. You're not gonna listen to vulgar profanity and then just start cussing like a sailor the next day. You're not gonna listen to music about, you know, getting hammered and then go get drunk the next day. Like that's not the way it works because those seeds that go in you, they take time to grow. It takes time for a seed to turn into a full-blown tree. There's a growing process. So you may put one thing in and it may come out as you lashing out at your family, you lashing out at your wife or your husband or being extra impatient with your kids or lacking in fruits of the spirit because there's only two seeds in the spirit. There's a seed of the enemy and there's a, there's the seed of the spirit. There's the fruit of the spirit and there's the fruit of the enemy. One of those is going to bud based on what you put in your spirit. 
And so we, the enemy has come in and he has, he has been so strategic. He has waged an all out war, an all out assault on our time, our attention, our eyes and our ears in this generation. Never before in human history has a generation had as much immediate access to information and pornography and every defiled thing in the earth as they do on their cell phone in their back pocket. It's never happened before in history. The enemy's intent is to entertain us with things that will desensitize our spirit into seeing reality and hearing what God actually has to say. We're a society that is so caught up with violence. And I don't mean like the Avengers, which I'm a, I'm a superhero fan, but I'm talking about like grotesque violence we see around horror season and, and during the summer and those types of movies. We're a, 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 a culture caught up with violence and the enemy is using this to desensitize us so much that when I say that 60 million babies have been aborted since 1973, people don't blink. A baby's aborted every 30 seconds and we're completely desensitized to it because we hear about it on the TV and what happens on that TV is not real. But I do wanna declare a word today that I believe something is shifting in this generation. The blood of almost 60 million babies is crying out from the ground and the church is agreeing with it and I believe the Lord is responding and we are going to potentially see the overturning of Roe v. Wade in this generation and we will look at abortion like we look at slavery in the past. Something is shifting. You see, the enemy seeks to rob God of our affections. He's not just robbing us of our destiny. He's robbing God of our affections that are due to him by redefining our entertainment. I'll put it this way. If worship and study of the word is the training grounds for our spirit, mainstream entertainment is the all-you-can-eat buffet that leaves you passed out on the couch two hours later. It, it, hear me say this differently. It makes you spiritually lethargic, disengaged in worship, uninterested in the word. But the reality is, is God created us with this beautiful thing called an imagination. Imaginations, the, the enemy's trying to shanghai our imaginations and use them for evil when God designed our imaginations for good. Put it this way, God had to think creation up before he spoke it into existence. Think about that. He created us with imaginations to lead us into fascination and wonder when we read the word. He created the imagination as a meeting grounds to hear his voice, to hear his heart, to see what he's doing to experience what he's feeling and to get fascinated with who he is through his word. You know, I, I had a conversation with a guy this last year. He was like, Michael, you know, I try to read the Bible, but it's just boring. What? Like, it's not boring whatsoever. I mean, when you get into the Bible, there's stuff for guys in there. It's borderline like Clash of the Titans, men fighting demigods. There's a guy who gets thrown into prison by his brothers. He, he rises up, he gets thrown into slavery by his brothers. He rises up in slavery, becomes the head of the household, right hand to the master. The master's wife accuses him of rape, falsely accuses him of rape. Then he gets thrown into prison. And he rises up from the ashes in prison. And in prison, it becomes known that he's filled with the Spirit of God and can interpret dreams and in all things. And then lo and behold, Pharaoh of Egypt has a dream that nobody can figure out. And somebody goes, I know a guy. And they go get him and bring him. He ends up becoming a father to Pharaoh and saving an entire dynasty from famine because of the Spirit of the Lord on his life. For women, believe me, there's so much stuff for women in the Bible. You're looking at Ruth. You're looking at Esther. I mean, Esther's a normal woman, except she's extremely beautiful. She gets brought into the king's court. She gets one year of spa treatments. Can we get an amen from some women about one year of spa treatments? Some of these men, we need to up our game, guys. I'm just saying. So she gets brought in for one year of spa treatment. She gets brought to the king. She wins the heart of the king. She's the most beautiful one in all the land. Then they find out that all of her people are going to be annihilated. So she goes and she moves the heart of the king. He not only saves her people, but she, he vanquishes her her enemy, and then they live happily ever after. Like these are the stories and they, they originated in the Bible. So to tell me it's, it's boring, it's not real, it's because we, we get the cliff notes in the Bible and it's our responsibility to dive in and to meet with God in the context of imagination and let him breathe on that thing and bring it to life. It says in Proverbs 25 two, it's the glory of God to conceal a matter. It's the glory of kings to search it out. And in Revelation, it says that we are a kingdom of kings and priests. So it's our responsibility to search out the deep things of God. And God has given us this meeting grounds called the imagination where we can tap into, see what he's seeing, hear the testimony of Jesus over our lives, over others, and even over the text. I wanna give you an example. Just everybody close your eyes. Just every eye close. Please, please honor this moment for everybody around you. Every eye closed, not one eye opened. I'm gonna give you a random picture, okay? And I just want you to picture this just... Take a breath. 
I want you to picture a pink elephant wearing sunglasses. It's okay to giggle. Holding a sparkler. <laughs> Standing on one foot. You see it, right? Okay, open your eyes, wipe the slate clean, open your eyes, okay. I'm gonna, uh, one, two, three, close your eyes again. All right, slate's clean, we're back to zero. Now, I want you to picture a woman with beautiful dark hair. She's down on the ground, her, she's, she's got her face on the ground, she's weeping, almost uncontrollably. You can hear it, you can, you can hear her sobbing. Just picture this in your mind, you can hear her sobbing. As you look closer, you see that her face is actually She's, she's kissing these feet just repeatedly out of gratitude. She's weeping constantly. Her tears are beginning to, to wet these dusty feet and, and wet the mud on these feet. And, and she doesn't care that they're dirty. She begins to take her hair and, and, and wipe these feet with her, her beautiful hair. She doesn't care if she's getting dirty. It's, she's just doing it. And as you look at her, you see this hand come on top of her head, just like a, it's okay. And as you, you follow that hand and that arm and you look up, you, you see this picture and you see Jesus sitting at this table and this woman is weeping at the feet of Jesus. And you, you look at his eyes and his eyes have no judgment whatsoever. Compassion, mercy, love tenderness. And he just starts smiling at her. And then in the background, you, you can't really see these people, but you can kind of, they're kind of blurry. And you see, you start to hear these whispers. Oh, if you only knew what kind of woman she was. Oh, if you only knew what she had done. If he was really a prophet. And you see this smiling Jesus look at her and almost whisper like, just hold on one second. And he doesn't even look at the accusers. He doesn't look at them. But his eyes grow intense like flames of fire. And he says, Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house and you gave me no water for my feet. But she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven loves little. Woman, your sins are forgiven. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. So you can look up. So what, what just happened is you stopped for a minute and we looked at the text and we met with God in the place of our God-given imagination. And we got to hear the testimony of Jesus silence the voice of the accuser. And I believe there's many people in here today that you're dealing, some of you are dealing with lots of accusations. Some of you are dealing with one or two specific. And I wanna tell you that the testimony of Jesus over you is that you're not bitter you're better. You're not a bad husband. You're a great husband. You're like your father. You're not a struggling wife. You're a beautiful bride. You're not a poor son or daughter. You're heir to the throne. You're not lacking anything. You have access to everything. And I want to encourage you that uh, in that same moment where the Lord smiled at her, he's smiling at you right now. God's not mad at you. He's not sad with you. He's mostly glad with you. And he wants to release his testimony over your life that silences the voice of accusation and lets you feel, hear, and see exactly what Jesus is thinking about you and wanting to do in your life. So let me pray and we'll wrap up. Pray, pray this out loud with me. Father, redeem my imagination. 
let it be a meeting place for me and you. Holy Spirit, show me Jesus. Let me hear what he's thinking, hear what he's feeling, and see what he's doing.